Hey everyone, this is Mia Dagger and welcome to the Hot Topic Show. My guest for today is an award-winning DOP specialized in wildlife. He has worked on 17 of David Attenborough series. He has done work for the BBC, Animal Planet, Disney Nature, Netflix, and he once had the lens hood bitten off his camera by a Siberian tiger. And he's also an author. It is Gavin Thurston. Hi Gavin, how are you doing today? Hi Mia, I'm doing very well. Very nice to meet you. Or e meet you. <laughs> yeah. So the, le- the thing that I mentioned about the S- Siberian tiger, is it true? Uh, yes, it is true. Oh, it's gone. It's quite a long time ago now. It was actually in the former, well, what was known as the Soviet Union back then. So we're talking what, 25, 27 years ago, something like that. Um, so it was in the Soviet Far East um, in, a, in the Ussurisk Reserve near Vladivostok. Um, and we're filming Siberian tigers, which, as you know, is the largest cat in the world. Um, they are blooming massive and pretty scary. And uh, we were actually filming one in an enclosure and I had a hole through the... Um, uh, the Russians cut a hole through the fence for me so I could put my lens through. And um, after an hour or so of filming, the tiger definitely got interested in us and the camera and eventually just came over and just <laughs> lifted up, put its whole mouth around the lens of the camera and took the lens head off the camera. Um, and we were able to retrieve it the next day. But um, no, that was pretty exciting. I was fine, of course. It was fun, but I don't know. Like, Is it scary? Like... Uh... Um, well, in that situation, not particularly scary because it's the other side of a fence. Um, and as we know, no animals really should be in an enclosure. It would be much nicer mm-hmm. to see that animal in the wild. Um, but tigers have been persecuted for decades now and, are, and in, in rapid decline. Um, yeah, so that wasn't particularly scary. I mean, I stood back for the camera. I wasn't going to tell the, the cat off <laughs> and try and stop it from biting the lens head off. Um, but no, that situation was not scary, no. So Gavin, where to start? You traveled all over the globe. You have seen more of this planet than anyone has ever seen. And you've worked with Sir David Attenborough. Are you the happiest person on earth? Um, I don't know about happiest. I'm sure there are lots of happy people out there, but certainly I do feel very lucky uh, to have had those opportunities and travel the globe and see so much as I have. you know, saying how many countries you've been to used to be kind of a badge of honor, but in these days, uh, it's actually almost an embarrassment because obviously it's indicative of how much you've traveled and how big your carbon footprint must be, um, which in this era of uh, climate change, perhaps is nothing to brag about. Um, But the good thing is my job has involved filming in all those places um, and sharing it with people like yourself and people around the world um, through their TV screens. So it's quite nice to be able to share it virtually it's a bit like this you know we're not meeting face to face but you can see who i am and we can chat and so on um so i suppose my career i've been very lucky that i've seen those places but i can at least share it with a a global audience um to give you to give you an example i mean uh, recently um i suppose one of the most recent things i worked on was uh, david attenborough um a life life on our planet yes a life on our planet and that was also linked to the series um our planet on netflix yeah Um, Well, to give you an example of the size of the audience, um, Our Planet was seen by 138 million people in one month, the first month it launched. And Netflix estimate that perhaps it'll be seen by 2 billion people in its 10 year lifespan on Netflix. So it is a huge outreach. You know, it's amazing to be able to reach so many people around the globe. So uh, yes, I'm very lucky. And how do you think like your, your view on life differs from normal people living all their lives in the city? Um, Again, I think I'm very lucky because after all, we are animals and I know we're supposedly civilized and we have houses and electricity and running water and all that kind of stuff, but we're still basically animals. We still display animal behaviors. um, And I think we still have a very close connection with nature. I noticed that behind you in your picture, you've got some flowers in your your house. Yeah, and is it amazing? Are, Are you in a city now? Uh, yeah, a, a little bit far from the city, but uh, yeah, there are a lot of buildings and not a big amount of uh, plants and uh, trees. You know. Well, that's what I find interesting, that you have a connection with nature, so much so that you'll actually want to bring flowers into your house, you know, yeah. so you still want to have that, no matter how small, 
you still want that connection with nature. And luckily for me, my office is is the natural world. It's um, I'm always surrounded by greenery wow. and wildlife. Um, yeah, so I think my perspective is, uh, I say it's very fortunate I see these things firsthand, but it is nice that I can share them. I'm very lucky. I live in the city of Bristol. Um, yeah. We're about, oh, probably a mile and a half from the centre. Bristol is a pop has a population of about half a million people, um, but it's a very leafy city. So I'm very lucky that we have a garden which is almost 50 metres long and 10 metres wide. So that's my little kind of green sanctuary when I come home. Um, but I do find that I need to see greenery. I need to see birds at the bird feeder. I need to see the foxes trotting through. Um, for me, it's like a tonic. It's a, you know, it's an essential part of life to have that connection with nature. And I realize there's a lot of people in big cities that don't have that connection. Um, so, yeah. And where do you think like is your home in the wild or in Bristol? Because home is where the heart is. Um, home is definitely here in Bristol for me, um, although wherever I am, I feel perfectly at home. So I've just spent uh, seven weeks camping in, um, and filming in Tanzania. So I've been in a tent in Tanzania in the pouring rain, in the rainy season. <laughs> um, but for me, I, felt, I feel very at home there. So wherever I am, I feel at home, but obviously my family is here. Um, so this is where my heart really is. Okay, that's amazing. So, Gavin, can you tell us about your relationship with Sir David Attenborough? Uh, well, I think for many of us in this industry and for many people who study wildlife around the world, David Attenborough has been the catalyst. You know, he's been so inspirational to so many people, um, you know, through our TV screens. He's such a passionate storyteller. Uh, he's knowledgeable. Uh, he's an all round good guy, really. Um, so I think that the connection started with seeing him on TV. And then luckily, um, you know, I followed his, his passion and followed his course. Um, and eventually I got to, to meet him and work with him. And in fact, I've been working with him now on and off for the last oh, 30 plus years. Um, so I've been very lucky that, that, that the man who inspired me is the man I actually have got to work with a lot. Uh, I've watched A Life on Our Planet and it was incredible, like, and so inspiring. Thank you for such a good work. How was the shooting of it? Um, uh, well, for those of you who haven't seen A Life on Our Planet, uh, it's on Netflix. Um, so do, when, as soon as you've watched this podcast, don't you know it yet. Um, but as soon as you've watched this, then watch A Life on Our Planet because it's a story about David's life on our planet, literally. He's been on the planet Earth for 94 years. Uh, he's witnessed an awful lot of... Um, of this planet you know he's worked on all seven continents um, but also during that 94 years he's seen massive change so when he was born I think there were about two billion people on the planet and now there's 7.8 billion um, and also because of that uh, you know that expansion of human population we've displaced a lot of wildlife we've displaced a lot of the natural world uh, and we're losing it fast and so this is his witness statement about his time on our planet um, and hopefully when you watch it, not if, when you watch it, um, you will feel empowered um, that you can actually do something yourself to actually change and try and halt this destruction, human's destruction of the planet. Um, yeah, so we went to lots of interesting places, um, filming lots of examples of, I say there's lots of positive examples in the film about things which are still there, um, you know, natural phenomenon which still occur but also showing there's an example of Chernobyl, which as we know was a massive disaster 30 odd years ago, but showing now how actually Chernobyl and Pripyat, the, the town, has actually been allowed to bounce back and nature is, is, is reclaiming that city. So it shows the healing power of nature. So I, I hope you find it a very uplifting film. Um, I say starting work on it, it was a bit depressing when you get all the facts and figures and you see what humans have been doing for the last few hundred years. Um, but the fact that David gives us solutions, he gives us things we can personally do to make a difference, empowers us. So um, two years ago, I was a full on carnivore. I was eating meat three times a day, like a lot of people. Um, and I never believed that actually today I would be vegan. Um, totally uh, vegan or you eat oh, less? Totally vegan, totally vegan. So oh. I'm not, um, so no animal products at all. So I have a cup of coffee here, which is a vegan cup of coffee mm -hmm. uh, with a pea-based milk. 
um, uh, called Sproud. It took me a long while to find a replacement. But how, how do you keep your energy if you don't eat meat? Oh, drugs. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Um, uh, well, the first month was difficult. So going full vegan, it was kind of a challenge. I was kind of shamed into it by my um, son and daughter-in-law. Um, you know, they, uh, they moved in with us at the start of the pandemic back in February because um, they've got a flat locally, but they, because we have a garden and they have a dog, it was made sense them, for them to come back here. And over a month or two, I mean, they're both vegetarian, almost vegan. And over a month or two, they kept asking me questions and, and questioning me about why I meet, eat meat and the ethics of it and the connection with my job as a wildlife cameraman. Um, and I didn't have an answer for any of their questions. So in the end, they said, look, you know, give it a month and see if you can go vegan. Uh, so my wife and I, in fact, the whole, as a household, we went vegan. Now that first month um, was difficult. I did, I did lack energy. But once you work out what foods you need and what food groups, it's very easy. And the, the best thing is, it's really cheap compared to eating meat <laughs> in the UK to get quality meat. So uh, we actually save a lot of money. I've lost a bit of weight, amazingly. Wow. <laughs> I probably need to. Um, but... Um, no, give it a try. Or even give it a try one day a week. You know, that'll make a massive difference for the planet yeah. and for your health. So can you tell us about your best memory with Sir David Attenborough? Oh, my best memory. I mean, there's, they're all best memories, really. But um, I suppose one lasting memory for me was filming for Congo? a series. In Congo? Uh, yeah. Yeah filming for a series called um the life uh, was that for life of mammals i think it was yeah and we went to film um chimpanzees there they're rehabilitated chimpanzees which have been rescued from the zoo trade and pet trade um, and what they try and do is they try and put these chimpanzees back into kind of family groups and then teach them the skills they need to be able to survive on their own in the wild so we went with david to film them um cracking nuts there was a, a chimpanzee called belinga who was a young male of about four who was learning to crack nuts, you know, using tools, either a rock or a, um, a stick. And um, that trip was particularly memorable because it was hearing and filming David, you know, in front of me, filming him um, talking about our ancestry and how we evolved from primates. Um, and there were the primates doing exactly what our ancestor, ancestors would have done. And there was one moment when David and I were stood up to our almost chests in, in water uh, with a camera to be safe from the chimpanzees and in the background the chimpanzees were moving from one island to another and these chimpanzees in order to utilize all the islands they've learned to wade across the water and they don't like getting their hands wet so as they go into the water instead of walking on their knuckles they raise their arms up and they keep their hands and they're quite ungainly because they're not meant to be on two legs but they walk with their, their hands in the air and wade through the water uh, it was just a spine chilling moment and the hairs went up on the back of my neck. Um, it's a, a really iconic moment I'll never forget. And um, at first you were frightened to go to Congo, but the beautiful thing is that at the end, like the forest of Congo made you feel the most alive. Yeah, it's a very weird thing. I mean, I'm, we all know the word Congo and we all associate it with, um, I don't know, maybe King Kong or, you know, venomous snakes and malaria and yellow fever and the early explorers like Livingstone and Speak and so on. And the early travellers who went there a few hundred years ago um, suffered terribly. Many of them died for, through disease or being speared by natives or charged by elephant or whatever. So for me, the, that image of travelling to the Congo for the first time, I was quite nervous. Uh, but once you get there and you have the trust and support of the local people, um, they're not out to spear us anymore, thank God, <laughs> um, despite the history there. Um, then you actually gain confidence from them. And it's amazing moving through the forest, you know, your heart is kind of beating because you know just maybe 10 metres away are leopard, gorilla, elephant, you, know, you name it, buffalo, things that could flatten you that might be out to kill you. But in actual fact, Congo is quite benign. And as you move through there, I just found for me that my senses, maybe through self-preservation, but my senses came alive. So my sense of vision and smell and hearing, it's amazing how suddenly you're really aware of that 3D sound. So if you hear a bird, 
you know exactly where to look for it. You get to learn the different smells. You, you know, you remember the smell of an elephant or a chimpanzee or a leopard or whatever it might be. So when you smell something, you know what it is. But the other amazing thing is you're actually aware of, I mean, not consciously aware, but the wind on your face. And so if you smell something, you know which direction the smell's coming from. I mean, back in the day, you would kind of, you were taught to lick your finger and whichever was the cold side, you'd know that's where the breeze was from. But we have all the senses to pick it up anyway. And we don't have whiskers necessarily, but we do have very fine hairs on our faces and our, you know, well, you have hair, I don't. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you can, you know, but you can actually, it's amazing when you need to, you can draw on all those senses to actually detect where things are. So let's go back to when you were nine years old and you had your future career mapped out after taking with a very basic camera, a photograph of an orca out of the water touching a ball. How at that age you discovered the power of photography? Yeah, I suppose uh, it was a defining moment. Uh, basically, it was a school trip to Dudley Zoo, which is up near Birmingham. It's about 100 miles north of here in Bristol. Um, a school trip when I was age nine. And my kind Auntie Mary lent me her um, little box brownie, which was a film camera. I mean, it's about kind of this size. It sits neatly in your hand. It has a roll of 12 pictures. Um, so who knows, you, you know, if you give that to a boy of nine, who knows what you're going to come back with. <laughs> Um, anyway, two, uh, two weeks, I, when I came home from the, the trip, I remember telling my mother, I said, oh, we saw elephants and we saw giraffe and we saw this huge fish leaping out of the water, you know, to hit a beach ball with its nose. And um, it was about two weeks later that I went with my mum to um, the chemist to pick up the prints. So back in those days, you didn't have things like an iPhone with instant pictures or a digital camera. You'd had to wait till they were processed and printed. And we picked up the prints from the chemist and we came outside and I was flipping through them. I think the first one was maybe my feet out of focus. <laughs> one was maybe some elephants in the distance and then a giraffe. Anyway, about the fourth or fifth picture on the roll was exactly as I've described to my mum. There was this orca completely out of the water, almost completely out of the water, touching its nose on a ball held by a keeper. And I showed it to my mum and I said, see, I told you, it was this giant fish leaping out of the water. And it was only years later that I realized, I look back, I mean, actually it was when I wrote my book, that I look back and I realized that was a defining moment. That was the moment when I made the connection of the passion about seeing animals up close. And I know we shouldn't have orca in captivity now, anywhere in the world, any intelligent animal should be free. Um, but I could share with you now that same photograph, you know, however many years, 40 odd years on, um, and I can show you that split second moment when that orca did that leaping out of the pool. So that, so photography is a very powerful thing. And also if you look at the photograph, even if I didn't tell you the date, you could probably make a guess. You might say, oh, that's, well, it's black and white. So maybe it's, you know, 1960s, 1970s or something. It gives you a gauge as to when it happened. It's a very powerful thing. And as I say, that's kind of probably the defining moment that defined my career and the path I would take. So at that moment, you started thinking of becoming uh, a DOP or working in the film industry or no, later when you finished uh, university yes. uh, school? Yeah, I mean, it, at that time, I, no, I never, it never even occurred to me that that was even a career. Um, I suppose it was later on at school when my um, photographic passion developed. Um, to coin a phrase. Um, and I, I taught myself to take photographs and process them in black and white in the basement at school. Um, and I suppose that's when the, I realized actually that I, it, I created a hobby. You know, some people might collect stamps or bird watching or whatever, but for me, the photography was the hobby. But because I grew up with a very passionate grandmother who was, um, she was very passionate about the natural world in the UK. And she was very knowledgeable about the birds and the bees and the flowers and the trees. And I think some of that wildlife passion and nature passion uh, rubbed off on me. And so the two kind of naturally gravitated together to be, to photograph nature. So that would combine my passion of photography and wildlife. Um, and I was very lucky that that's how I kind of just slipped into it. But I still don't, I mean, I'm nearly 60 now. I still don't really know what I want to do when I grow up. I'll continue doing <laughs> filming and seeing wildlife and so on. But um no, I never, I was never one of those kids who knew exactly what they wanted to do. It's just kind of evolved and I've been very lucky. 
And there's something interesting you said in one of your past interviews and now that as your grandma like showed you the beauty of nature growing up, you are doing the same by filming wildlife and exposing the viewer to the wonder of nature. How does this help in the conservation of nature? Um, again, I mean, I've got, I've learned so much from Sir David Attenborough, but um, one of David's approaches is you can't tell people, you can't just say you must do this or you mustn't do that. The best way to get somebody to do something is empower them and give them the passion and the knowledge um, that they'll want to find out more. So the nice thing about wildlife filmmaking and the films we make are that, you know, people will see a, a beautiful sequence of, you know, cheetahs or chimpanzees wading or birds in flight or nesting or displaying. And because we all have this connection with nature when you see something amazing you might want to find out more about it and when you find out more that say rhinos are disappearing or orangutans are threatened or elephants have a, a shot for their ivory you start to care more because you're passionate about it uh, rather than just being told you mustn't you know you mustn't eat wildlife or you mustn't wear ivory or whatever it's much better that you decide for yourself not to do that so yeah, I think there is a conservation, a big conservation side to wildlife filmmaking that we can empower the world to see what's going on. And when you know what's going on, whether it's trees being cut down in South America or whatever it might be, you have the power to do something about it. And the best thing is now, because we live in a consumer society, if you're careful and you want to do something about it, choose what you buy, be aware of where it comes from, be aware of the impact. So if you live in England now, don't buy your, you know, be aware of the air miles of the food that's coming in. If you can eat locally, that saves a lot of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. Um, yeah, so I think that the wildlife film films do have um, a conservation side to them, but that's not the main goal. The main goal is just to show people the beauty of nature, but the knock-on effect is that then people care. And that's what happened with the Blue Planet series. People's attitude on plastic changed. Yeah, it's amazing. Blue Planet 2 in particular had a, a massive impact um, environmentally. Um, and I think what it was is people seeing that image of a, you know, a turtle choking on a plastic bag or whatever. That was, you know, people have been campaigning to stop plastic for years and years and years. And I think Blue Planet 2 came at exactly the right moment with exactly the right message and images um, that kind of galvanized a population to change about their use of plastic. Um, so particularly single use plastic, um, as he says, you know, cause I've got a whole wall of plastic behind me, but these, hopefully these plastic bags will, uh, these plastic boxes will last for decades. They're not just one plastic bag where you'll use for 10 minutes to take your shopping home. Um, yeah. So blue planet two, as a result of that, um, policy in the UK and around the world changed. So now in the UK, you can't just get a plastic bag for free. You actually have to pay for it and you're encouraged not, not to use it. You know, so many people I know now won't use plastic at all. I mean, I'll, I think now, I mean, back in the day, I was probably using 10, 20 plastic bags a week. And now I'll be, you know, if I have one a year, uh, that's shameful enough. And after the pandemic, did you realize uh, any changes in nature? Yeah, I mean, the pandemics, I mean, it's a crazy thing, but humans, have, we've brought it upon ourselves, really, with, I say, I mean, mainly to do with how we treat animals, how we farm animals, um, and how we look after them or don't look after them. Um, so we know that the pandemic started in the wet markets in China, where they have a whole menagerie of animals being kept in appalling conditions. And China, it's not, you know, it's not just China that does this. Um, but that has become a breeding ground for a virus which ultimately has killed more than a quarter of a million humans and it's probably going to go on and kill another quarter of a million or half a million before we actually sort out um, vaccines and so on um, but one positive thing from um, the pandemic is and I'm sure you noticed it where you are is just kind of a silence and actually you know the fact that you didn't have air travel you had less cars on the street no pollution no pollution wow. yeah yeah so we're, uh, whereabouts, I didn't never even ask, whereabouts are you at the I'm moment? I'm in, in, Be in Beirut, Lebanon. In Beirut. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, and again, Lebanon is, you know, it's quite a crowded, you know, you've got, Beirut's quite a crowded city. Um, so you must have noticed the difference, as I say, particularly with yeah. pollution and 
how the air is suddenly cleaner to breathe um, and how you might hear the odd bit of bird song or you hear the, I mean, in my garden, it was amazing. The bird song was just so loud and so, uh, so obvious. Um, but you could suddenly hear the wind through the trees, you know, in a city. Um, and it was actually really, really pleasant. I mean, apart from the downside of the virus, uh, the positive side of just nature being able to have a breathing space uh, was amazing. And you've ever been in Lebanon? No, I haven't. Uh, it's on my list of places to come to. I actually work with um, an amazing musician from Lebanon called Rami Khalif, who's a virtuoso um, pianist and an amazing man, really, really nice man. Um, but I have to say, I was quite ignorant about Lebanon and, and a lot of the history of Lebanon. Uh, but it's a country I would love to visit. I'm yeah. sure you've We have a beautiful nature here. Yeah. When you come, I can take it and show you. I might hold you to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gavin, let's talk about your recent book, Journeys in the Wild, Secret Life of a Cameraman. So it is uh, Sir David Attenborough who wrote the foreword. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I mean, I've had so many experiences over my career. I mean, my career isn't over yet, hopefully. <laughs> but yeah, I've had so many experiences um, that inevitably you end up talking about them. I mean, it's, we've talked about some now. And because of this, it's amazing the number of people over the decades who would say, God, that's an amazing story. You ought to, you've got some amazing stories. You ought to write a book. And so about 15 years ago, I thought, yeah, I think I'll, I'll write a book. So I would start writing these stories down um, and I would get all enthusiastic at the typewriter or the keyboard and um, right away. And then I would stop, you know, after about two hours, I'd stop and I'd get a cup of coffee and uh, I'd start reading it back. And my writing was so appallingly bad. It was embarrassing. It was and then I went to Africa. It was hot. I liked it a lot. And it was like a, it was like a child of seven had written it, you know, as a school essay. Um, anyway, so it put me off. Anyway, every time I worked with David Attenborough, he'd say, "Right, Gavin." He said, "How's that book coming on?" And um, he said to me, "He said, you know, if you finish it and I'm still around, he said I'll write a forward for you." And basically, that was kind of a catalyst to push me to try and get this book written. And then finally, out of the blue, a publisher got in touch with me and said, you know, we keep seeing your name on the end of all these films. You know, you must have had amazing adventures. Uh, have you thought about writing a book? And I said, well, yes, I have thought about it. And, um, you know, not very good at it, but, and they said, well, you know, send us a sample and, and let's see how we go. Anyway, the rest is history. I finally wrote it and it's out on the shelves now. Yeah. And you're thinking of writing later books in the future? Um, I'm getting, I've got such, I've had such an amazing response. It's things like this interview. Um, you know, it's amazing that the, the opportunities that writing that book has, has opened. And it means it's another platform for me to talk about the impact of humans on nature and how important nature is to us for our, you know, mental and physical well-being. Um, and lots of people have written and said, look, we've really enjoyed your book. It's been really inspirational. I've got back out and gone for country walks or I take my camera with me everywhere. and. Um, and then they all also go on to say, you know, God, I couldn't, you know, I was so disappointed when I finished the book, you know, are you going to write another one? So, uh, let's see. You I'd have like a lot to... of experiences to share and because of your love for nature, you, you became, um, like a talented writer also. <laughs> well, that's very kind of you to say, I might quote you on that. <laughs> um, uh, well, if you haven't read the book, anybody, um, read the book and see if you agree, but, um, Yes, I mean, I've had, what I've written about in the book is probably only a fifth of the adventures I've had, you know, of the, of the major stories. And uh, the book has been out now for over a year and I've had more adventures since then. So um, I certainly have got a lot of material in terms of writing another book. If this wretched COVID virus continues <laughs> and I end up locked in a basement like I am now, then maybe I'll have to get pen and paper out and write another one. You have to, to stay in this room for how long? Uh, 14 days. Oh, well, I have, yeah, so I have a small kitchen and I have a small bathroom. Uh, and my family are all upstairs, um, but I don't, if I do have COVID, I don't want to give it to them. Um, so I, by law, the government says in England, when you return from a foreign country, you have to stay indoors for 14 days. Um, I mean, our country's behaved, uh, you know, the government's done very, very badly at dealing this pandemic. We've had, what, at least 70,000 people die in the UK 
Um, I certainly don't want to be the next one and I certainly don't want family or friends to be the next. So the responsible thing is to stay indoors and stay locked down for 14 days. That's the best thing you can do. And I also watch Our Planet, all the episodes. <laughs> yeah, watch it again. Yes. Yeah. It's amazing. You know, I watch it many times. And also when I want to sleep, I put an episode, I watch it and uh, I sleep. It makes me feel better. Well, that's, that's a very common feeling. It's amazing how, how many people say exactly what you've said, that they just find it so relaxing. And also the voice of Sir David Attenborough, like, it's amazing. He's, yeah, he's definitely got the best voice for narration, that's for sure, yeah. So now I have uh, some questions. Uh, okay, okay, I will ask you. Uh, viewing the ocean from our point of view from land, when we look at the waves, it looks scary and mysterious. And all we can see is its dark blue color. So Gavin, as someone who filmed at the bottom of the ocean in a submarine with the depth of a thousand meter, what is the feeling? Is it claustrophobic, dark and scary? Um, yes, yeah, so I worked on Blue Planet 2. I worked on program 2 that called The Deep um, and I spent over 500 hours, not all at one time, uh, in a very sort, small uh, submersible going down, as you say, to a thousand meters. Um, I'd never been in a submarine before. Um, I was quite apprehensive, you know, knowing the pressures down at those depths is a hundred times the pressure on the surface of the water. And did you feel it? No, um, the, the submersible is designed very cleverly. So it's a perspex sphere and it's acrylic sphere, so clear plastic, and it's about nine inches thick, so whatever that is, about this thick. So you're protected from the pressures of the, of the deep. Uh, so when you go down to a thousand meters, we're still inside, we're still at atmospheric pressure. So when you come back up again, not like diving where you have to decompress, you can just step out and back onto the ship. But even so, it's knowing the pressure outside. I, I should have brought them downstairs, they're upstairs, but um, I can't go up there. Upstairs, I have some small polystyrene cups. They're about this big and they started off about this size. And if you put them in a, a small net outside the sub, uh, submersible, when you go down to a thousand meters, the pressure is so much that it compresses those cups right down. They're like little miniature polystyrene cups. So that gives you an indication of how, how much pressure there is at those depths. But the amazing thing is, is when you go down there, it's teeming with life. So you have fish and squid and octopus and all sorts of weird, wonderful alien creatures that can all survive at those depths and, and deeper. Um, it's like an alien world really. It's the most amazing, incredible place. And the other thing is, is that we've only seen about, we've only explored like 5% of our oceans. Uh, so for the young explorers out there, you don't have to go to Mars. You don't have to go, you know, sit on an airplane for, on, on a, you know, in a jet for, you know, nine months to get to another, another planet. Just step out. I mean, outside Lebanon, you imagine what things are, you know, in the, the depths of the, say, the Dead Sea. Well, maybe not so much there. Maybe it's all dead. But I bet there are things living in there. Uh, but in the oceans, there's so much to be explored. And it's a very exciting um, area to look forward to seeing. And were you surprised by some new creatures underwater? Yeah, so the submersible I was in, uh, it seats three people. So obviously you have an expert pilot. Uh, then you have me okay, as a cat sir. person. Oh, oh. sorry. No, the uh, producer or... And then, yes, and then, um, and then a producer or sometimes the producer would switch out with, say, a scientist. So a scientist could come down with me and the pilot. And um, diving with the producer and the pilot, we'd look out the window, you know, you'd look out this through this perspex sphere and you'd see all these amazing, weird and wonderful things and there's things which glow in the dark and flash and all sorts. Um, and half of it, we didn't know what it was. And when we swapped out with a scientist and we'd go into the depths again, so it'd be me, the pilot and the scientist. And I'd say to the scientist, see that thing there? I said, we've been seeing a lot of those, what's that? And the scientist would look at it and say, I have no idea. <laughs> and it's amazing that, so, you know, an expert, they can say, well, it might be this or it might be that, but I've never seen one before. And pretty much every dive we did, we saw new species, species that humans have maybe never seen before. And that's what's really exciting. And uh, you were going to film a series called Ocean X. It's produced by James Cameron. It's about the same concept, um, finding uh, new creatures. 
Yeah, so it's kind of, um, I start that project in January. It's, um, if you look online at Ocean X or Ocean Explorer, with just an X, not an EX Explorer, um, oh. you, you can see the, you'll be able to see the, um, the ship that we're going to be on. And the ship is, uh, it's kind of the very, very latest research ship. It has two submersibles. It has an ROV, a remotely operated vehicle that can go down to 4,000 meters, four kilometers um, under the ocean waves. Um, and there's going to be a series of missions over the next year um, going to look at different scientific phenomenon. And that'll be coming out, I think, at the end of 2022. Um, so that's my next adventure and holiday sorted for next year, uh, COVID allowing. It's something very interesting. Um, so what I wanted to ask you in this, when filming the sea lions, uh, finding a large group of fish, and after a few seconds, we see pelicans diving to grab some fish also. How do you know, like, at what spot on the water you should be located to film such a phenomenon and to have them the three in the same shot? Um, well, the one thing is that phenomenon you see is amazing to see it again. Um, you know, I mean, it still, it takes me straight back there. That's one of the few, um, there's not many places in the world where you can see that kind of spectacle of wildlife. So the fish, uh, that's on the, um, the west coast of Chile uh, um, and Peru, sorry. Um, and all the way down that coastline is very, very rich uh, ocean. So you get a lot of upwelling with the Antarctic currents and that's what feeds the krill and that's what feeds the fish. And that's why you get the birds and the sea lions and that whole abundance. Um, but what you see there is maybe 10% of what it would have been 100 years ago. So basically modern fishing techniques with our big trawlers and our big nets, we're taking so much fish out of the ocean that there isn't enough fish for the birds to be those numbers all the way up the coast as they used to be. So what you're seeing there, although it looks very healthy, is a tiny, um, a, a tiny sort of example of what it would have been like up that coast. But going back to your question about where to film, um, as with, uh, with a lot of nature, basically nature's in tune with itself. Uh, if you see a big flock of birds heading out, um, they're not just wandering aimlessly, they know exactly where to go. So if you follow them in the boat, they'll take you to where the fish are and they've got amazing eyesight so when they're up in the air they can actually detect from you know maybe 10 miles away they can detect one is the smell of the fish oils and two is seeing the fish oil even the smallest amount of fish oil on the surface so they know that's where the big shoals are so um the animals will take you to where the, it's very easy really you just follow the animals and they'll take you to where the maybe fish we are. have to try it yeah i mean i've just I say, i've just come back from I've just come back from uh, Tanzania and it's amazing where if you see all the zebra all looking in one direction, um, you can guarantee there's a predator there. If they're all staring, they don't want to get eaten. Oh. So you just see where they're looking and they'll point you to where the predator is. And it's the same with these birds. They'll point you to where those huge shoals of fish are. So filming a mass spectacle like that, I have to say is fairly easy because it just, wherever you point the camera, it just looks amazing. The sad thing is that there's very few of those, uh, you know, mass aggregations of animals left on the planet. Uh, Gavin, how, how do you spend your nights in the wild? What precautions do you take and do you feel safe all the time? Um, I always feel safe about around wildlife. Wildlife is not malicious. Wildlife's not out to just be mean to you. You know, if there's a snake in your tent or whatever, it's not there because it wants to bite you. It's got in there by mistake. Um, and the best thing to do is open the tent up and let it out. It doesn't want to be, it's not out there just trying to have a fight. Um, humans are the, in my, well, as far as I know, humans are the only malicious uh, species on the planet where they will deliberately cause harm to one another. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you come across a, a leopard and its cub or an elephant with its baby, just back away. Don't, you know, don't corner it so it has to protect itself. Uh, just be aware of, of the animals around you and nothing's really out to, to harm you maliciously. The only thing to watch out for really are things like mosquitoes, which can give you malaria because mm. they want to feed. And obviously if they feed on you and they're infected with malaria, they'll give it to you. Um, and more recently, wretched things like a virus. That's one of the only things in, in nature which will actually do us a lot of harm. Um, you know, it's out to cash in on the fact that there's so many humans on the planet you know, if you can feed on one and reproduce in one, then 
they take advantage of it. But otherwise, nature is generally not malicious at all. Do you take your sons with, with you to the shootings? Um, yeah, both my sons have been with me on various shoots over the years. I still work with my eldest son now, uh, but more on commercials and things. So I do shoot commercials as well. Um, and yeah, they, I, they both have a passion for, for wildlife. Whether they'll follow in my footsteps, um, who knows? Um, hopefully they'll get a proper job and earn some proper money. <laughs> and uh, what, uh, what do they do? Uh, and are they at university or not yet? Um, so my eldest son works with me, so we have um, a small hire company, so we design and build equipment for carrying cameras and moving cameras in a cinematic way. Um, so he works with me on that. Um, and then my youngest son, uh, he's a writer. Um, he hasn't made any money writing yet, um, but he's a very talented writer, more talented than me. Um, and I'm hoping at some point somebody will discover him um, and he'll actually get paid for the work that he does. Um, But in the it's early days, you know, they're, they're just, uh, well, my eldest is 31, youngest is 30. Um, and in this day and age, that's quite young, really, to decide. You don't have to decide what you want to do. Um, so who, who knows? I wish them all the best. Thank you. <laughs> uh, what story you filmed in nature and you felt it was like a metaphor of something you are living? Oh, that's a very tricky question. Perhaps you should have sent me that about a year in advance. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's, God, that's way too intellectual for me. Um, okay, let's come back to that one. Have you got another question? Okay, maybe you can think well, of it and later well, you can... Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Throughout uh, your years of filming, did you see anything that made you cry or made you think for days after finishing filming? something maybe cruel, something uh, sad, I don't know. Um, I see, yeah, I mean, I see lots of sad things, really. And the things that sadden me most are where humans have influenced wildlife um, and wildlife is suffering as a result of humans. I think the, um, the bushmeat markets in, say, Central Africa, so you go to a marketplace to buy, you know, beans or rice or whatever for an expedition and there, next to the beans and rice, you might see, say, a monkey's hand or, you know, a dead, beautiful bird that, you know, is being sold for, for bush meat. And I understand that, you know, people have to eat, uh, but coming from the West, when you see these beautiful animals and knowing how endangered they are, um, that I find quite sad. Um, one is that people are so desperate they have to eat that. Um, and two, that the animals um, suffer as a result. Um, And, and simple things like, you know, if you go to a, a turtle hatchling beach, um, you know, a beach where turtles will nest, um, and then you've got maybe hotels or restaurants. So when the turtle hatchlings emerge 80 days later or whatever, after the eggs are, are laid, and the turtles are, you know, they're so tuned into the stars and the moon and the sound of the tide and so on, that they get confused by the lights, you know, human lights of restaurants and, and hotels and things. And so instead of walking down the beach into the ocean, they walk towards the hotels and get run over on, on roads and things. And there's lots of places now that are aware of that. Um, and during nesting season, they will actually turn lights off or they'll put up um, shields so that the turtles aren't distracted. Um, but it's just quite sad that humans have had such a, a bad influence on nature in terms of its demise. Maybe, I don't know what should be done this kind of uh, series maybe that's the best thing because may, uh, people they don't know sometimes these facts about animals and no i think i think people are getting smarter and i do think that wildlife films are getting the message across and a lot more wildlife films now aren't just beautiful pictures they have a conservation message and as say david attenborough a life on our planet the film out now Um, it does give us, it does empower us, it gives us solutions. Um, simple things like, as I say, reduce the amount of meat you eat. You don't have to give up meat, but if you have one day a week when you don't have meat, or if you have, or just don't use plastic bags, or if you have a plastic bag, use it over and over and over again. Don't just throw it away. Um, you know, I think there's lots of things that we can do as individuals that will make a difference, that will help correct uh, all the wrongs we've done over the past, you know, decades. 
What, do you, what lesson do you think um, wildlife can teach us? Um, don't waste. Don't take more than you need. Um, I mean, wildlife doesn't produce any, you know, it's not producing plastic. It's not, uh, it's not overpopulating anywhere. It just lives within its resources, you know. So if you have, say, those birds in that sequence from our planet, there will only be a certain number of birds because there's a certain number of fish. Whereas what we're doing is we're taking the fish from the birds, we're taking the, you know, land to grow our beef on instead of forest for animals to live in. So humans are using more than we deserve. We're using more than, um, than we should. And we need to just cut back on how many resources we use. So that's the, the lesson we need to learn is just live within our means. And um, yeah, don't waste, don't take too much. Um, you know, don't pollute if, you, if possible. You know, walk somewhere instead of driving if you can, or take a bicycle. Uh, try and reduce how much you fly. Um, plant trees, you know, try and, you know, try and help rebuild nature. Uh, there's lots of things we can do. They should uh, consider uh, nature while like doing architecture also. Well, that's, that's happening already. So if you take cities like Singapore or Barcelona, uh, in fact, lots of cities, there are lots of cities in China where they're deliberately designing buildings now that include um, foliage. So they've realized now, instead of sticking an air conditioning unit on the side of a building, if you have balconies with plants and flowers and, and trees and things, one is they clean the air, two is they keep the building cool. Um, and you don't, have, they don't really need maintenance, you just have to water them. Um, you know, and it means that you have birds and bees and you know, things visiting. So if you're in your office or in your, your house, if you have a balcony with a, a window box with flowers, you'll get the pleasure of seeing, you know, the birds and the bees and, and, and butterflies and things coming to visit you. Uh, so the architects are already doing that. And actually there's a big movement now to design buildings better uh, to include, na uh, include nature and uh, foliage uh, for the benefit of all of us as humans. I have some fast questions before we end. Okay. Okay, far away. Yeah. May I know why you respect snakes, although most people hate them? Um, snakes are beautiful things, and um, they're not beautiful like a, you know, um, well, no, they are beautiful. There's such a variety of snakes, and yes, they have venom, uh, not all of them. Uh, in fact, most snakes are non venomous, but they serve a purpose in nature. Uh, they eat rodents and, you know, pests and things that otherwise we'd have to put poisons down or traps down for. You know, they're part of the balance of nature. And as I say, they're not malicious. They're not out just to bite you and, and kill you. Uh, they serve a purpose. Um, and you can't remove one thing out of that complex web of nature. So um, I think they're beautiful. I just, I treat them all as venomous because I'm not very good at identifying them. <laughs> So if you see a snake, don't go too close, but watch it. I mean, there's something beautiful about how they move and uh, it's something magical about snakes. You filmed in different conditions. Which was the most challenging? Uh, for me, filming in the cold is the most challenging. Um, you, can, you can dress up so you can get all the right layers. Uh, so for instance, I was at the South Pole um, this Christmas just gone. Um, and you can have all the layers, but for me, being a cameraman, the most difficult thing is, is well, one is my nose and two is my hands. So you can cover everything else up so you're never cold, but because you have to put your hand on the camera and the lens and the pan handle and you've got lots of fiddly buttons, I could never get the right combination of gloves. I've got 17 different pairs of gloves, um, ranging from very thick mittens down to thin silk inner liners, and I can never get the, quite com the right combination. So for me, filming in the cold is the most difficult and challenging. It is. <laughs> I hate cold, by the way. But if you have the right clothing, and for you, if you're not operating a camera, there's no reason for you to be cold. You know, there's people live in those extremes, you know, up in the high Arctic and so on. If you have the right clothing, and there's lots of good clothing now, um, it's, they're magical places, you know, with the, the ice and the, the snow. Beautiful places to visit, and you can dress up properly. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever develop any sort of friendship with a specific animal while filming? Um, friendship's possibly the wrong term. It might be friendship from my part, from the animal's part. It's probably I'm just part of the furniture. 
Um, I worked on a series called Big Cat Diary, and I was lucky for the first um, uh, for the first nine weeks to follow a leopard called Half Tail. Uh, she was called Half Tail because she had half a tail. Uh, when she was young, she had her tail bitten, half a tail bitten off by a hyena climbing a tree. Um, and what was amazing over those nine weeks, because we were with her every day from morning to night, there were only three days and nine weeks we couldn't find her. And we always were respectful of her and her hunting and her cub. We would always park a long way away because we have big lenses, we can do that. Um, and over the week, she just learned to trust us. Um, and she learned to trust our vehicle. And on hot days, uh, she trusted us so much that she would actually come over to the vehicle and go under our car for shade. Um, and when she had other vehicles coming, she would sneak out from under our car and go and hide in the grass. And then once the vehicles had gone again, she would come back. So she saw our vehicle as a safe thing. And for me, that was, um, that was just really nice to avert her trust. It's a touching story. <laughs> what is your favorite thing about Sir David Attenborough? Um, God, he's such an amazing man. I say he's a, he's very intelligent. He knows so much about the natural world. He knows a lot about fossils, about history. Um, I mean, if you were going to do a quiz and you're on a quiz team, he's the man you want on your quiz team because he's so knowledgeable and he can recall so much information, but also he has a passion. And I think anybody, you know, whether it's a talented musician or an artist, you can see a passion in somebody and David, he has a passion and that passion is infectious. Um, and it's a really endearing quality. Um, and he empowers all of us with his knowledge. Um, he's just uh, basically he's an all round good guy. I mean, you can't say any more than that. Um, and I don't think that any of us can aspire to be as great as him because he's, you know, he is a one off. And the best advice he has given you. Um, Probably the best advice he, he's given me, which I haven't followed, uh, was to spend more time at home. Um, I've spent the last 37 years as a cameraman, um, traveling all, all around the globe. And yes, I've seen amazing things. But while I'm seeing those amazing things, I've not been with my family. And it's only later on in life that you suddenly think, yeah, maybe I should have spent more time at home. You know, I missed a lot of my boys growing up. Um, those years you can't get back. But when you're growing up and you're, you know, you've got an amazing career, you kind of get blinkered to real life and you just carry on. And it's only later on that you suddenly think, oh yeah, I've missed this, I've missed that. And you don't get that time back. So that was probably the best advice he gave me um, and I didn't follow it. Now I want to cry. <laughs> 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 so what is your advice for young wildlife cameramen? Um, it's a tricky business to get into, but you don't have to necessarily have this as a career. If you have a passion for wildlife and you have a passion for photography or filming, uh, just get out and do it. As you said yourself, you know, uh, Lebanon has amazing wildlife. So in your country, you know, if you have spare time and you can get out to see it, go and sit and just observe the birds and the animals and things. Um, don't always see it just down, you know, the viewfinder of a camera, see it with both eyes. Um, study the behaviors, study the movement of animals, uh, spend time with nature, you know, even if it's just, you know, maybe it's a flower pot on your, on your balcony and you've got a bee coming to visit. Um, spend time with nature um, and you'll learn so much and you'll gain so much from it. Um, and through that, if you want to then pursue it as a career, you're already, you know, that every time you're watching something in nature, you're learning um, and you'll be able to apply that to your, um, your craft as a camera person. And there are a lot of stories to tell from the like, smallest thing. Maybe from oh, a yes, flower. Don't, yeah, yeah. Don't overlook the smallest thing. You don't have to go and just film, you know, lions or leopards mm -hmm. or elephant. You know, there's a whole microcosm of, of um, behaviors going on, at, you know, whether it's ants or beetles or bees or butterflies. You know, look at that closer stuff as well. And that's, it opens up a whole magical world. And in fact, the first eight years of my career was spent filming mostly macro stuff. So mostly things this kind of size. And the behaviors are, are just, you know, just astounding really. Did you film the Alcon Blue Butterfly? Wait. Which one, sorry? The Alcon Blue Butterfly. I don't think, no, no, I'm not familiar in, with that. No, in our planet. This butterfly who, like, the, it spent 
uh, two years with the with the ants. They feed them, and then later she flies. I have, yeah, I did actually. I have filmed that species about twenty years, or well, a very similar story about twenty years ago, where the um, the butterfly mimics the pheromone of the ants, so it can go into the ants' nest to lay its eggs. And then the ants get fooled into thinking the eggs are their own, so they nurture the butterfly, uh, nurture the egg, and then the, pu uh, the caterpillar, and so on. Um, so I have filmed a very similar story, but I didn't film that for uh, for our planet. Okay, because I, I love so much that story. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, I like the fact that the butterfly can trick. Yeah, that can trick yeah. some ants into looking after its its young. It's very clever. There's lots of stories like that in nature. And it's like it's sad when she leaves, and the the ants are at their place and the butterfly leaves and fly. Yeah, but yeah, but the cycle will continue. As long as man doesn't screw it up, the cycle will continue and it'll happen every year. So Gavin, after 50 years, will our planet survive? Yes or no? Our planet will survive. Uh, whether it's good for humans or not, I don't know, but um, the planet will definitely survive. I have, I'm a great believer that nature heals if we give nature a chance, it will bounce back. Um, and we need nature, you know, we rely on nature. Um, so humans just need to, we need to change our ways and make space for nature and let the wild come back. Um, and I'm very hopeful and, um, yeah, I'm very hopeful that it's gonna happen. Thank you so much, Gavin Thurston, for being on the show. I really appreciate the work that you do for us and for our planet. And you took us to places we never thought of seeing before. So thanks for sharing your stories. Well, thank you very much for having me on your show. And um, I look forward to coming to Lebanon one day soon. Yeah, and uh, I will take you, I, I told you, to different places. Yeah, I'll hold you to it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. Until our next time, bye.